Welcome new interns! This is your introduction to psychometric statistics created and narrated by Dr. Jennifer Cochran. Alright, so if you haven't noticed already, we speak in our own foreign language around here. In fact, we speak with a lot of acronyms. So much so, you probably have no idea what we are saying. You might hear someone say, hey, my kid scored a 5 on Ramel Finger Windows, or this woman has an FSIQ of 65. You might always hear me say, look at this Rayo, I'm thinking NLD. You might also get a lot of people asking you to print different things. Hey, can you print the AQ, EQ, SQ, and the SRS for me? Yeah, it's enough to be mind-boggling. So it's my hope that this introduction will begin to help you to understand our language a little bit better. It's our goal that in the very near future, you will hear a score and immediately know what the person's performance was like. You'll know, should I be cringing right now at that score or high-fiving the kid? It'll make your world a lot more easier around here. To begin learning our own foreign language, you have to understand the statistics and the numbers that we use. Once you know those, you'll catch on in no time. Sure, the test acronyms are easy to learn and remember because you're going to see them often enough. They're going to be in front of you all the time. But it's once you learn the numbers and what the scores mean for each test, it's then that you can begin to put together a picture of the child or the adult who's being tested. You'll know hey, they're actually doing really, really well, or no, these numbers are not where we need them to be for a person this age. As you'll learn, this knowledge can also help you detect errors in your work or even our work more easily. We should always note that when working with so many figures and the volume that we've got going on in our clinic, we're all susceptible to making errors and miscalculations. You know, even though you're the student, we realize that any one of us could be making these mistakes. That's why it's really important for all of us to have some sort of oversight or double checking. Um, we'll be checking your work and you'll be checking our work. So we all know that we can all make these mistakes. What is psychometry? So as a brains intern, you're going to get experience in psychometry. In fact, you're primarily going to work directly with our psychometrist, Micheline. So this is the branch of psychology that deals with the design, administration, and interpretation of tests for the measurement of psychological variables such as intelligence, aptitude, and personality traits. Okay, so we've got to get down to basics and it can't get any more basic than understanding the bell curve. The bell curve represents the normal distribution. The normal distribution is often referred to as the distribution of grades on a test administered to many people. Normal distributions are extremely important in statistics and are often used in sciences such as psychology for real valued random variables whose distributions are not necessarily known. All right, I want you to think all the way back to that research methodology class you probably had to take as a psych undergrad. The terms are very important. Specifically, we want to know what is a standard score, what's a standard deviation, what's the mean, and what does a percentile mean. So standard score, there are many of them, and often you can hear IQ scores, scaled score, Z scores, t-scores, percentiles. The standard deviation is how far away from the mean is the score placed. The mean is directly in the center of the bell curve as you can see with the red line there and standard deviations sit on either side of the mean. Positive to the right, negative to the left. Understanding standardized scores. As I said previously, a standard score is a score that can be placed on the bell curve. In statistics, the standard score is the number of standard deviations an observation or data point is above the mean. So a positive score represents a data point above the mean, and a negative score represents a data point below the mean. It is a dimensionless quantity obtained by subtracting the population mean from an individual raw score and then dividing the difference by the population standard deviation. 
Now we're going to talk about this in a few slides and tell you exactly how to calculate something like that. But this process, this conversion process, is called standardizing or normalizing. You're taking an individual score and then making it generalizable to the population's distribution. It all begins with a raw score. With any test that we have, the individual obtains a raw score. This is the number of points obtained within a given test. Each test may report a different kind of statistic, but nearly all can be converted to the bell curve, meaning they can be standardized. The raw score tells us nothing until we convert it to a standardized score. For example, a raw score of 40 for a 7-year-old means something completely different than a raw score of 40 for a 32-year-old on the same test. This should help you understand the process. Let's look at the evolution of a test score. Again, we start with the raw score. This is the individual's performance. Whether the test measures the sum of points or how fast the person completed the test, this measure only tells us how this person did on the test. It does not tell us anything else. So now we have to compare this person to other people similar to them, whether it's by gender or age or education. So we find the norms. These are normal scores compiled by these demographic features. We find a mean and a standard deviation reported for the group that we're interested in. Once we have all of these bits of information, then we can then calculate the z-score. Once we have the z-score, we now know where that score falls on the bell curve. We can say this individual performed in this manner compared to other people just like them. There's one smaller step after that. Once we got the z-score, we then calculate a scaled score. It's just a different score on the bell curve that we use to report the scores that are easier to understand. Let's look at the process of normalization a little bit closer. Remember, the raw score doesn't mean anything to us. It tells us the person scored 40, but that doesn't tell us how it compares to their population. So as I said, for each test published, there have been norms collected. They have taken neurotypical males and females of different ages to take the test, and then they have calculated the mean and standard deviation. What I mean by neurotypical is that these are people who are not known to have any sort of concern that would have contributed to their performance. We can then use this mean and standard deviation in order to figure out how our client or patient compares to their peer group. Calculating the z-score. So to convert the raw score into that meaningful standardized score, we need to calculate the z-score. We need to have three pieces of information to do this. Obviously, you need the raw score, you need the mean, and the standard deviation. And then there's an equation to follow. The z-score is equal to the raw score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Sounds easy enough, right? But they can be tricky because z-scores can be positive or negative. It's very important to consider what the test is. Is a high score a good thing or a bad thing? This will indicate if the z-score is truly positive or negative. Let's take an example. On the mind and the eyes test, the more points the better. If the mean is 10 and someone scores an 8, they've got less points than average. So let's do the math. 8 minus 10 equals negative 2, and then you would divide by the standard deviation. In this case, a negative z-score is correct because they performed less than average, which is the mean. However, on the trail making test, a faster score is better than a lower score. If the mean is 10 seconds and someone scores 8 seconds, they are faster than average. Again, doing the math, 8 minus 10 is negative 2, then you would divide by the standard deviation. A negative z-score is incorrect. The sign should be positive because they performed better than average. And you're not finished yet. 
So you've got the z-score, we can place it on the bell curve, but it's sort of rare for us to report z-scores. A z-score should be converted to a scaled score, another type of standardized score. We utilize the z-score conversion table to find this scaled score. Okay, so from the top, let's do an example all the way through. We're going to convert the score from a raw score to a z-score, figure out what it means, and calculate it into a scaled score. So we've got trails A, and this is completely fabricated. Uh, but let's say the raw score is 34.5 seconds, the mean score is 38.3 seconds, and the standard deviation is 5.86. Let's do the math. We take the raw minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, and we find that our z-score is negative 0.65. We have to verify the plus or the negative sign. The person was actually faster than the mean, which is a better score, so the sign should be positive. Let's make our z-score now 0.65. If we look at our table, we want to find 0.65, and we want to go to the positive side. Let's see what standard score area that falls in, and it looks like it's a standard score of 12, which we know to be a high average score. If the score was a negative 0.65, we would look to the right side of the graph here and find that this falls into the scaled score of 9. Pop quiz time. On a speed test, Carrie finishes in 20 seconds. The norms manual says that females her age usually complete the task in 18 seconds with a standard deviation of 2 seconds. So, what is the z-score? Do you see your answer here? The answer is negative 1. So z is equal to 20 minus 18 divided by 2, which is 2 over 2, or 1. However, she's slower than average, so the z-score should be negative 1. Let's get to know the different standardized scores. Each type of standardized score has different properties along the bell curve. They have different means and different standard deviations. Standard deviations, as I've said many times already, are very important to understand because they tell us how far away and in what direction the score is from the mean. Knowing how many standard deviations from the mean easily tells us the percentile the score is in. So for example, if the score is plus two standard deviations away from the mean, we know that this score is in the 98th percentile. Okay, so the standard score. It can be called many things. You might hear composite score, quotient score, IQ score, or index score. These are scores that have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So you can see it there on the bell curve. Every 15 points plus or minus from the 100 mark is a standard deviation. Tests that are large batteries will usually report composites, which are made up of subtests. The subtests are usually reported as scaled scores. Let's take a look at IQ scores on the bell curve. Here's a picture of the bell curve that shows the distribution of standard scores, or as we know them right now, as IQ scores. So every 15 points is a standard deviation. Now it's important to know that the standard deviation does not always follow the range or the classification of the IQ score, which you can see in the box to the left. So an average IQ score is typically within the range of 90 to 109. And then you can see how the different classifications range as you go up and down away from the average range. So the borderline range of ability is 70 to 79. Anything below 70 is where we start to become concerned about impairment and there are different levels of cognitive impairment which you'll eventually learn later. We can tell that giftedness begins at 130 and above. Bazinga! 
A scaled score is another type of score that falls on the bell curve. You'll see it right underneath the standard score on our graph here just to compare the difference. A scaled score has a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3. And you'll find that the range is somewhere between 1 and 19. So someone with a standard score of 100 is the same as someone with a scaled score of 10. A T-score is a score, again, on the bell curve, but this time we have a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. Now, T-scores can be tricky. You need to understand the test to determine if the score is detecting something good or bad. For example, a high T-score on the WASI, or say the categories test, indicates a good performance, while a high T-score on, say, the Mackey, or the social responsiveness scale, indicates clinical elevations of the symptom that's being tested. And let's not forget the Z-score. The Z-score has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Z-scores actually line up directly with standard deviations, meaning that a standard deviation of negative 1 is a Z-score of negative 1, and so forth. Here's a quick look of all the scores together on a single bell curve. You can see the standard score, scaled score, t-score, or even percentile all listed there for the ease of understanding for families. So this customized bell curve is what we use during our feedback sessions. So we're able to plot each person's performance on a specific test, and it doesn't matter what score we're reporting, the family can easily see where um, and what range that score has fallen into. Ah, the data grid. You're going to become very familiar with the data grid before the end of your internship with us. So the final product of an assessment is the Neuropsych report. On the last page of the document is the data grid which reports all scores for the testing battery. The types of scores reported varies per test. Tests can report composites, scaled scores, percentiles, T-scores, and or grade or age equivalencies. We have created a template that includes every test and how we would like it to be reported. This template grid can be found at the end of every uh, report document to be edited. This will just be a very brief introduction to the data grid. You're going to get much more specific training of exactly what to do. But as a brief sort of glimpse, what we've got is typically the age and name at the top, and we try to do our best to group the tests together by the domain that's being tested, executive functioning, attention, all those sorts of things. But it's not always possible. You try to keep it as neat as possible for easy reading, and you pay attention so that you don't accidentally insert the wrong thing, like raw scores. It's also very easy to inverse numbers, but we got to understand an 86 and a 68 are very different from each other, and we don't want to report the wrong thing. Being very knowledgeable about the bell curve and the standard scores will allow you to notice mistakes more easily. Now you've got a chart to score. Where do you start? Most of your training will be direct observation or guidance by Micheline. But when in doubt, ask someone in the assessment clinic. There will always be people around. You can also refer to other places in the clinic, such as the Procedure of Psychometry document. Now, this has not been updated in a while, but it does contain directions for most of our tests and how to score them, or at least where to find the scoring application. Let's recap. So, we've gone over some key terms. Standard deviation, mean, standard score, and all of those research methodology things that you thought you would never use. You've been reminded of the bell curve and how important it is for us in neuropsychology. You've been told the process of normalizing a test score and has been shown how to calculate a z-score. We've gone over several different standardized scores and how they relate to each other. And then finally, you were introduced to our data grid and a brief picture of what we like that to look like. So this is a lot of information, and you're not going to remember it just from this initial presentation. But I hope that this is a start to getting you on board for what your semester is going to be like for us. 
These are things you're going to hear daily and see daily, but eventually it's going to become very natural for you. And when you look back at this presentation, you're almost going to laugh because it seems very, very elementary. But it's very important to understand from the get-go because it's going to make your time with us much more valuable and easier as you learn all of these things with us. So I wish you luck, but just keep in mind that this is a lot of stuff to learn and that we're all here to help you out. So don't be afraid to ask. And you're going to be working with all of us, so you'll have plenty of opportunity to ask questions when you might be confused. So I wish you luck. Thanks for listening to me, and I hope that this has been helpful and enlightening. Everything, everything, that's all, folks.